So for me, it's like, get out of your head. And your head, of course, is your ego too. And get into your heart. If you've ever met someone who's genuinely thriving, someone who is radiant, magnetic, and wildly alive, and wondered, what's their secret? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the Be Marvelous Podcast. Welcome, my love, to another episode of the Be Marvelous Podcast. I am your host, Marta Kagan, and I am on a mission to help women over 40 build unfuckwithable self-confidence, break out of repetitive patterns, and feel sexy as fuck at any age. And the path to that is to get out of your head and into your body. And today's guest is going to talk to us about some ways that you can, well, maybe not get out of your head, but certainly get out of your way by leaning on self-forgiveness, self-compassion, and even taking to account the words you use to describe yourself and other people. Quick introduction before he joins me on the show. My guest today is Dr. Ilya Gorgoris, who is the president of the Happiness Center, an organization of world-leading experts in the field of positive psychology dedicated to creating personal success and happiness. He's also the founding partner at the Global Institute of Thought Leadership and the author of the number one best-selling Amazon book, Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness. I'm so happy to have him on the show. He is an amazing human, a true leader in the space, and there's a reason, and he'll share it with us, as to why he was dubbed the happiness doctor a long, long time ago. Let's jump into the episode. So welcome to the show, Dr. Ilya. It's so good to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So you are known as the happiness doctor, and God damn it, if everyone doesn't want to be happy. <laughs> I'm really curious. Do you feel that happiness is something achievable for everybody? And then my second part of that question is, how did you arrive at this designation in life? Like, how did you get to this role? So the first question is the easiest one, which is, yes, I believe everybody is capable. I think happiness is a choice, but it's also a skill set. Mm. And if we do certain things on a consistent basis, I guarantee you, you will find happiness in your life. That's that's given. Okay. How I arrived to become the, the happiness doctor, actually, it's a kind of a, a funny story. It started from the day I was born. I, I know this may sound really bizarre, but I was born a very long time ago in Athens, Greece. Back in the day when they didn't have uh, Instagram live, they, there were no tapes, there were no videos of my mom, right? Giving birth it was just her. That... As the story was told growing up, my dad, who's a tough Greek man, smoking, drinking, also, shows up at the hospital and asks the nurse, which one's my son? And there was a little window, five babies, all wrapped up in the same white generic blanket. They're kind of looked the same. And apparently at that time, I had a smile on my face. So the nurse turns to my dad and says, your son, he's the happy one. And I was branded happy from the get-go. So growing up in my home, like, well, you came out of the womb happy. You've always been happy. So that was like my personal brand, if you will, even though... We didn't have personal brands back then, but it was. Yeah. That's for now 25 years. And I'm in graduate school getting my PhD in psychology. And we have a professor that's talking to us about the difference between nature versus nurture. In other words, how are we, what is our makeup, our genetic predisposition, our DNA, or our environment? And of course, the truth is they both contribute, right? So I had this crazy thought. I remember sitting in class, I had this crazy thought. I'm like, wait a minute. Based on what he's saying, what if my dad gets stuck in traffic? He shows up at the same hospital, the same nurse, asks the same question, but 15 minutes later, and at that point, I'm having terrible stomach pains, and I'm screaming my head over, my face is all red and all that, and the nurse turns to my dad and says, your son, he's the cranky one. Mm. And then I am raised in this family going, well, you came out of the womb cranky, you miserable little beep. Ah. Now, I have worked as a clinical psychologist for 18 years in private practice, and coach and lecture all over the world about happiness and wellness and have met hundreds of thousands of people. My experience is this. There are some brands like the happy one, which are amazing. Actually, if you've been blessed with a brand like that, that spot, lean into it and count your blessings. And there are many of them, the adorable one, the cute one, the sweet one, the princess, the smart one, the athletic one, the jock, 
If you have any of those brands, that's great. Good for you. And congratulations. And I feel really blessed that I have one of those. However, my experience has been, sadly and unfortunately, is that most people don't have those kinds of brands growing up. What's really, really sad, Marta, is the three most common, which to me are horrific brands, are the following. The ugly one, the fat one, or the stupid one. Over and over and over again. I've heard this in my office over and over people that and you might say, well, who in the world would actually say that? But unfortunately, that's the case. Now, since we're talking specifically about your audience and women, as a result of that, I decided when I created this talk about your personal brand to reach out to the audience and to empower them. If you don't like your brand, today is the day to change your brand as an adult because you inherited your brand. That wasn't your brand. That's not the real you. Yeah. So I'm at a conference in North Carolina about 10 years ago, 500 women, it's a women's conference in me. And I'm doing my bit, just like I'm doing right now. And out of the corner of my eye, this older lady in her 70s, gray hair, stands up and starts waving her like this. And, and she kind of throws me up like I'm doing my thing, like I'm a keynote speaker, but yeah. I can't ignore her because now the audience is looking at her, they're looking at me and um, it basically threw me off. And I didn't get thrown up very often. I'm, I, I can do this in my sleep. So I stopped and I'm like, Ma'am, yes, no. And she said, you know, I'm 70 some years old. My name is Leah. That's important later on in the story. After listening to you share this, and she proclaims that for 70 years plus, she didn't have one of those brands. She had all three of them. And mm. then some, because I've been called ugly, fat, and stupid, F and this, a couple of adjectives on top of that. And she goes, you know, after listening to you, it's time for me to change my brand. Now, first of all, Marta, I don't think I would have been this vulnerable enough to share this in front of 500 strangers. I don't know if I would have the courage to do what she did. But she was courageous to do that in front of 500 strangers. But it was so tense when she shared what her brand was, hmm. you could hear a pin drop. Literally, everybody froze. And they're looking at me to do something. And I'm like, well, this never happened. It's like a... So I, I turned to her and said, ma'am, okay, thank you for sharing. Well, what would you like your brand to be from this point forward? And because she goes, well, from now on, I want to be known as Princess Leah, almost like Star Wars, Princess Leah. Yeah. As soon as she says this to me, I turned to her, I like turned to her and I said, yes, your majesty. And I bowed down to her and, I, and, and it cracked up. The audience cracked up. They started to laugh and a very tense and emotional moment became this very lighthearted, in, in beautiful moment, and then I went on with my talk. Why do I share this with you and your audience is this. Because to me, if a 70-year-old woman can change her brand, then anybody else can do it. So for your audience, we've all been branded, whether we remember it or not. Go back and think about it, whether it happens in our home oftentimes, but sometimes it can happen through elementary school, middle school, or whatever. And ask yourself, and be honest, this is the time we have to look in the mirror, like literally go to the mirror in your restroom and look into your eyes and say, yeah, if it's a great brand, good for you. Like, that's awesome. Embrace it and be grateful. But most likely or oftentimes, it's not. Decide for yourself today, enough. Yeah. I deserve to have a different brand and I deserve to give it to myself as an adult now. So that's kind of a long story short of how I became. So happiness for me has always been part of my life. Mm. And it has come relatively easy in a lot of ways. Much to yeah. my disappointment, my wife sometimes people mm -hmm. are really like, and I have a big heart and I love big. And it's just like, how do you do that with so many people? I'm like, it's my mom. Yeah. Really, well, my mom, who unfortunately died when I was 22 from cancer and devastated me and just destroyed my life initially. Wow. Her parting words to me, Marta, was before she died, were, don't worry about me, honey. I'm going to be just fine. I just want you to be happy. And then she really wanted to come and die within the next 24 hours. So for the first year after that happened, I had just graduated from UCLA. I grew up, I had a great family. But after that, mom's gone, who was, my mom was my hero. My mom was not loved by men and women. She was beloved mm -hmm. which is because she was all heart and no love, unconditional for everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So dad starts to drink even more in his grief because my dad was in love with my mom and his life was over and it really went over. My older brother left doing his own thing. So I went from having this great life to losing everything. Mm. Actually, for the first year, I was so lost. I was like a lost puppy. Completely. Mm. 
I didn't want to get out of bed. Unusual for me. I usually had life. Yeah, life the life. happiness guy. Yeah, totally. Depressed. And it, I wouldn't say I was suicidal, but I was like, God, if, if I get hit by a bus today, I'm okay. So I can be with yeah. my mom. Yeah. And that was a full year like that. I was barely surviving. I was just going through the motion, just forcing myself to get out of bed. But something miraculous happened on the anniversary of the one year anniversary when my mom died. Because anniversaries are tough, especially the first one. It's hard. Something snapped inside of me. And I remember my mom's words. Don't worry, honey, I'm going to be just fine. I just want you to be happy. And in some, I don't know how it happened, but my soul actually heard it almost for the first time. It's mm -hmm. like, you know what? The best way to honor my mom is to find my happiness. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you for sharing that beautiful story. Uh, I, I feel that. I feel that. And I think it's so important, especially to hear from you who's dedicated your life to cultivating happiness, to showing other people that it is a choice. It is a skill you can build, as you said, that you too went through this period where that was inaccessible to you, where even now we're having this conversation decades later and you still feel the grief and you feel the loss and you can feel into the transformation that happened when you reheard your mother's words again. And we can all have that moment where something, something sparks that change, something becomes that catalyst, something empowers us like the woman at the conference to, to go, wait a second, pull the needle off the record. Something's got to change. And I also wanted to say that I really appreciate you bringing up the, the whole piece about our personal brand and how we acquire those adjectives, those words that describe us early on, often be without our consent, without exactly. our awareness, right? Without our consent. Yeah. And then we internalize them unconsciously. It just becomes now this is the foundation. This is the baseline. And sometimes it's decades or in some cases a full lifetime before you realize that that's the soundtrack playing and that it's coloring the whole experience. But if you change the record, that's it. Change the looks, just like literally changing a record changes the mood in the room. It's got that same impact. I grew up, my grandfather used to say in Russian, he would say, roughly translated, if you call someone a pig enough times, eventually they'll start to oink. And it's that same idea. We do have power and choice in how we perceive ourselves and the world, but you have to step out of the autopilot, which is how we operate most of the time. One of the most touching things that I've, and, and I've lectured all over the world, is after the conference, the women's conference that happened in North Carolina, women went up to that lady. It was so touching and hugged her and loved her, loved on her. Mm, that's wonderful. I loved hearing that. That's like the antidote to everything that's on the news. So beautiful. And I take my hat off to this lady, to, to Princess Leah, in some ways, because I don't know if I could have done it on, if I was in her place. I think I would have played small and not said anything. Yeah. And to proclaim that she wants to be a princess in her 70s, yeah. it was so beautiful. I, I wish I had, I wish I had recorded that. I wish there was a, like back then, someone had recorded what happened. It just lives in my memory and it, it's as real today as sharing with you as if I'm on stage 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful moment. I totally get that. So I'm curious, Dr. Ilya, in your work as a clinical psychologist and now as a coach and speaker and author, you've worked with a lot of people. You've heard a lot of stories. I'm particularly interested, given my audience, in stories around women of a certain age. So women over 40 going through both physical and hormonal changes that come with perimenopause and menopause. And then the life changes where if you have children, they leave the house. Or if you didn't have children, you're just going through this midlife season, right? Where you notice the clock ticking in a different way than you did 10 years prior. So I'm curious, what would you say in your work with in meeting all these people, what's the number one challenge? What's the biggest obstacle to experiencing happiness for women of that age group? You know, in my experience, and of course you can say, well, your statistics are kind of skewed because people came to you because you're, you were a psychologist and so on. But the majority of women, and I would say 75% of my practice were, were women. And I had a full practice with waiting lists. I mean, never marketed. It was all word of mouth. I had an amazing practice. Most of those women came in uh, with low self-esteem, low self-worth, depression, anxiety, oftentimes as a result of childhood trauma, whether it's sexual abuse or emotional or physical abuse. 
or in relationships that were toxic, dysfunctional, and they were basically drowning. And they were like, some of them, they were on their way out. And they clearly said, because oftentimes in my practice, I would have people come in and say, you know what? You are our last hope. I've been to counseling, I've been to marriage counseling, so that nothing has helped. You come highly recommended and referred. This is it. If this doesn't work, then whatever, right? So I had a lot of pressure. I felt the internal pressure, like, oh my gosh. I believe that I have a, a God-given ability. I've had it since I was a kid. To be able to see somebody else's full potential as a human being, crystal clear, by the way, long before they could see it in themselves. Oftentimes I would work with addicts too, who would come in and say, my name is Mary and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm like, actually, that's not true. First session, by the way. And by the way, my PhD, my dissertation was on Alcoholics Anonymous. So I know I got a very unique dissertation that I, even that AA allowed me to even come into AA and actually do a study, which obviously was very unusual. So I, I knew the 12 steps, not as an alcoholic, but I knew it from the studies that I did. And I know that they say, hey, my name is so and so and I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, actually, you're not. And they're like, what? I'm like, no, you're a wife, you're a mother, you're a sister, you're a daughter, you're a friend, you have your professional. And yes, I'm not denying it. And yes, alcoholism has wreaked havoc into your life. No question about that. And I'm not denying that. But you're so much more than that. And at first, they wouldn't believe it. They're like, I don't think you understand my addiction. I'm like, I don't think you understand what I'm saying to you. Because what I see in you, you can't see it yet, but you will by the time we're done. And then slowly over time, as we begin to do the work and the healing, these wonderful and beautiful transformations took place. And I feel so both blessed and honored to have been on the front row and yeah, seen yeah. miracles happen. Yeah. People began to see what I saw in them and began to, for the first time perhaps, in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, start to love themselves. Ah, yes. But before that, start to like themselves. Yes. Yes. That's really the magic. And that is the reason why I get up in the morning. I, I want to empower women to find within themselves that compassion, that courage, that confidence, that power that really resides within each of us, but that gets forgotten and covered over and like put in a little box tucked under the bed while the outside world tells us who we are and how we should be and how we're too much or not enough and all, all these things, right? Shame plays such a big role in the culture, especially for women. Um, expectation, obligation, being the good girl. I mean, we could spend the whole episode just talking about the challenges that any woman would face in, in today's world. But what I'm curious about, having witnessed miracles, having worked with so many people, can you boil down what is the number one thing, the one shift, that happens in those miracles that unlocks their ability to love themselves or even like themselves. What is that recipe? It's not that hard. Oftentimes, at some point, maybe not the first session, but the second, they would begin to disclose stuff and they're like, not even my husband knows this or my kid or anybody else in this planet. I've never shared this with anybody. Oftentimes, traumatic events, shame, major shame. And my role was, in, and I, you don't learn this in school, the PhD you get it, you put it on the wall, it has nothing to do with that. My role really was to love them no matter what they said, no matter what they said, no matter how, and just hold space for them in full and unconditional love. And sometimes they will disclose something and then they would feel like, oh no, it's out now. He knows the truth about me, quote unquote, the truth. And the next session they would like, maybe sometimes cancel because they were too embarrassed to come in. And I would have to talk to them on the phone and bring them in. Because they thought I would change because of the new information that they had shared with me. And not only did I not change, I loved it even more. Because I'm like, you went through that? Think about the courage. You're, sur you're a survivor. Think about how amazing you are that in spite of everything that happened to you, you're still standing. Yes, but no, no, there are no buts. You're still standing. You're still here. And you're still taking care of your four kids and your husband and you're working in spite of everything that happened. You are a hero. And they're like, what? Like they, they, they couldn't, the words came out of my mouth. There was cognitive dissonance. They're like, yeah. they didn't see themselves as heroes. So for me, the formula was hold space for someone with unconditional love and acceptance with zero judgment, no matter what they tell you and no matter what they've done. And if you do that wrong enough, eventually they start believing it in themselves and they start. So you have to mirror that, right? You have yeah. To That's exactly the word that was coming to mind was. It's really, it's really a superpower you have, the, the ability to hold the space 
to fill the space with unconditional love and safety, which makes it possible for them to reveal these vulnerable things and not shut it down or mash it with shame and hide it. And then you're providing like a reflection. You're sitting with them in front of the mirror and saying, here's what I see. I see that you're a hero, that you're resilient, that you're a survivor, et cetera, et cetera. And they're looking at the mirror and they're seeing someone that has failed, that's been hurt, that's wrong, that's whatever. So now that's the cognitive dissonance. But if you keep showing them this reflection, eventually, as my grandfather said, if you tell someone they're a pig enough time, they'll start to oink. That can be a good thing too. If you tell somebody enough, they're a beautiful soul yeah. and smart and capable and warm and loving and kind and so on. And all the attributes that, that women have, yes, eventually, and that's the miracle. And it's yeah. beautiful to see how they transform in, in front of your eyes. And then to follow their life path. Uh, oftentimes, I would have a housewife. Not that there's anything wrong with being a housewife. But, you know, that's your role, basically. That's your role. And, you know, and to begin to speak up to their husbands, to begin to show up. As a lioness, to begin to show up as a powerful, powerful woman. Sometimes that led to a divorce, by the way, because men couldn't handle that. Or you changed. And I'm like, yes, it's changed for the better. Yeah. And so you can keep up with her. Yeah. <laughs> they thought I was biased toward, you know, in favor of women or not. But really, I wasn't biased. I just want them to step up and become kings for their queens. Yes, I love because, that. Yeah, because they, would, they were becoming queens in... The guys were still playing small and they couldn't handle a powerful woman, not a woman that wanted to control their lives by any means, but somebody who was coming into her own, right? Yeah. And I would put support of that. And they felt, a lot of them, they felt insecure. So I think there's some work that men also need to do to feel secure, to be next to a woman that is powerful beyond measure. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's an interesting challenge in the dynamic that I think keeps a lot of women stuck, right? Yeah, and my motto was don't play small to his insecurities don't get riled right. up. Right. You step up to your best self and hopefully, ideally, he will too. But sometimes that didn't happen in the dinner. Yeah, I know that. And I saw her trajectory after years of being controlled or years of living in the shadow of somebody yeah. else, being a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. So the call to action for, to me, all women is never live in the shadow of anybody else again. Yes. Uh, Ever. Yes. Fuck yes. Yes, that's really live important. Your, live in the sunshine that you have created of your own soul. Yes. Yes. I love that. That's I the love that. Seriously. I'm curious, Dr. Ilya, what role you feel women's sexuality plays in their ability to love themselves, like themselves, and stand in their power. And the reason why I ask this is because my observation, both as a woman in her 50s and a coach and speaker and author who works with women who are doing this work, right? Stepping into their power, reclaiming their truth. Right. That so much of the cultural conditioning, starting with your family, starting with, depending on what religious background you come from, depending on what part of the world you live in. But it's still generally universally true, with very few exceptions, that women's sexuality is this thing that is no longer viewed as sacred, but as something salacious, as something that needs to be hidden, that is something shameful, that is something, there, there's a power dynamic to it. And I think that what happens is then a lot of women become disconnected from that, right, as a reaction to it. And they... It's a huge power source also. For men, this is not the same issue because it's more celebrated for men to be in their like sexual power. So I'm curious what your experience and your perspective is on that and how that plays a role, if it does, in finding your happiness as a middle-aged woman and beyond. I, I think it does play a role, but I need to ask you a question because for me, I thought things have changed. Have they not changed? <laughs> well, I'm honestly speaking, I, I thought we have evolved to some degree. Where women yeah. say, oh, be celebrated versus uh, try to be put in her corner. It yeah. Has... Perhaps we have compared to, I don't know, the 1950s or the 1920s. For sure, there's been progress. But the degree to which I see women, even women who in, to the outside world are successful, are powerful in their profession or career, who seem confident and put together, I do a lot of work with them around intimacy and sex and love. And it's 
a different ball game. Like the confident woman in the boardroom does not behave that way in the bedroom. There's a different dynamic, especially if she's a mother, but not necessarily. So it, we have a long way to go. That's the method. Well, I'm, and that's sad for me to hear, if that's still the case. I don't think you can be fully your high self if you cut off or repress any part of you, including your sexuality. How could that be? That would be like saying, okay, I'm not going to use my right arm, but I'll use the rest of me and the rest of me is good, but I don't use my right arm. And sexuality is energy, it's power, it's life force. <laughs> you think about it. And to be able to be a sexual being without any shame, without any guilt, and to embrace that, you're right. When men do that, oh, oh good for him. Well, what a man, right? When a woman does that, there are adjectives that are associated with that. It's rare to see an empowered woman that's in her fullness. <laughs> yep. but, and to be celebrated by other people saying, well, good for her. She's sexy and beautiful. She owns it. And how appealing that is, right? Yeah. Versus trying to silence that or minimize that or, or make it salacious, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't think we can be fully, anytime we cut off an arm, you know, our sexual arm, we're not full. So how can we be our best selves if we're missing something like that? Yes. Yes. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. It's like cutting off an arm. If you don't express all of you, then you're still repressing a part and it's not possible to have that full experience of vibrant, alive and, and radiant and happiness. And I think the message around sexuality, even especially for our younger people, have been so skewed in a lot of ways because of pornography, that real intimacy, I think the younger generation is really struggling with that. Yes. Matter of fact, people are having less sex than they used to have. The other yes. thing, think about that part. One of the most pleasurable I mean, we're going in the other direction, I know. Like, whether it's self-pleasuring or whether it's, you know, come with, yeah. with somebody else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the pandemic didn't help, by the way. Yes, that's so right. true. We, again, we can do a whole episode on that. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. But thank you for answering that question. I think it's such an important message I try to drive home. And again, it's always shocking to me. Again, even working with women who are confident, powerful, successful, all these things really in their masculine is the truth. That's where that success and power comes from or disconnected from this essential part of their, of themselves, of their life force energy, or are not even familiar with the parts of their body that are right. vital to that life force energy and to sexuality. So I'm glad we hit on that point. I would love to hear from you because I often talk about getting out of your head and into your body as a primary pathway to accessing your aliveness, your potency, your pleasure, your power, all of those things. What do you coach your clients or work on with your patients, if you still have them, around getting out of the head and using the body? Or like, what are your thoughts on the mind-body symphony? Maybe I don't do it exactly the way that you do in your expertise, but everybody talks about having a powerful and winning mindset. I talk about heart set. Not necessarily your body, but your heart set. Where is your heart set, right? Because I believe that when we are in alignment with our heart, we're really thriving and we're living a great life. But most of us are like cut off at the head. Look here. And oftentimes, even though our, our minds are important, they can also be so destructive yeah. with the inner critic and the lies flat out lies that the, our, our mind sometimes sometime says about us. And the internal musician, like we talked about, even with a personal brand. So for me, it's like, get out of your head. And your head, of course, is your ego too. And get into your heart because your heart is your intuition. Your heart is your knowing, right? Knowing the truth. When you're in alignment with your heart, life is pretty good. And you live your life that way. And I've gotten older, I'm like, ah, forget the ego. Now it's all heart. Love big. Just show up with love. That's it. Heart. Nothing else. I'm not sure what answer your question about your body, but to me, it's mind and heart. Those are the things. Yeah. No, you you are answering it in your way, right? With your experience. I'm wondering if is there a specific tool or exercise or pathway into that? Because I've had conversations with clients before where conceptually the idea of you got to get out of your head and get into your heart, your body, your soul, like intellectually, they understand this concept. But practically, if you're really operating from the neck up all the time, sometimes you feel like, I don't know how to do that. I don't have access to that. I'm cut off. So how do you help some guide somebody into that aspect of themselves? Yeah. First of all, you got to get quiet. You have yeah. to quiet the mind. If you want to exit your mind, you have to quiet the mind. 
busy. Uh, so to me, meditation, yoga, which is physical also, even practicing mindfulness and coming, connecting with what is your purpose? Why are you here? Why are we even talking? Why are we even doing this today? You and I, you know why? Because our purpose is the same. You and I, we're here to make a difference in people's lives. That's what really drives us. Yeah. And when we do what we, what our purpose is, we actually tend to be pretty happy. That's what, that's one of the seven paths that happen, right? Yeah. 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 Far too often people, and especially as a coach, and I work with a lot of executives would come in a full midlife crisis. And I used to say, why wait until your midlife to have a crisis? Why don't you have a midlife reflection? Yes. I love it. I love it. No, what becomes a crisis? First of all, yeah. it's less financially, emotionally, and otherwise. And be honest with yourself, am I living the life that I thought I was going to be living when I was a kid, when I used to fantasize and dream about, or am I 60, 70 degrees off? And why am I living this life? Right? The, the, the beauty about getting older is that I don't give a shit about what people think. Yeah. Hey, Amen. I, I love that. <laughs> because living my life, it's a good life. And I invite people to come along for the journey and to empower other people. Just live your best life now. Do not procrastinate your happiness. Did you know why though? Like epidemic, right? Yes, because people would say, I'll be happy when I have enough money, when I have a family, when I have kids, when the kids grow up, when they're out of college, when the kids get married, when I retire, when, forget all the ones. One of the beautiful things about that came out of the pandemic, even though it was very hard for, for billions of people, including myself and everybody else is life is too short. Don't take life for granted and live your best life now. Don't wait for the wins because some of those wins will never come. So stop procrastinating and live your best life now. And of course that starts with self-care. So self-care to me is a non-negotiable physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And people sometimes have done podcasts all over the place. People said, well, isn't that selfish self-care? I'm like, yes, do more. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Yes. Love it. More self-care, right? Yeah, of course. And of course the other. I think which is a big part of it is the ultimate act of self-compassion, Marta, is self-forgiveness. That's the mm -hmm. ultimate act of self-compassion. Really don't know how to do it. And like my self-forgiveness list right now, empty. There's nothing in it. Bye. Not, not one thing. There's one item. Oh, yeah. Well it's, bragged, Dr. Ilya. Well bragged. No, but, I, but it's the truth. We yeah, said, well, yeah, I love it. Yeah. And, you know, I said, well, how do you do that so easily? I'm like, first of all, I don't take myself so seriously. I could, Hey, I'm the doctor, I'm a big shot. Whatever. No, I don't know. If I make a mistake, I make a mistake. And I go back to my, one of my role models, Nelson Mandela, who beautifully years ago said the following, he said in life, either you win or you learn. In other words, there's no loss. There's no yeah. mistakes. If you learn yeah. something, right. You and I have accomplished certain things in our life over the years, but haven't the greatest lessons in our lives come from what at the time appeared to be weaknesses, setbacks, mistakes, and failures. Honestly, yeah. of course. So therefore, when you look back, now the tough things to do is what, when you're going through it, because when time passes, you go, I know exactly why that happened to me, because I wouldn't be where I am right now had that not happened. And in some ways, even rejection, I believe is protection. Think about that. Rejection is protection sometimes. So yeah, the forgiveness list is empty. So I have a process that I take people through and it's not that hard, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to share it with you, like how do you yeah, self forgive? Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Grab a piece of paper and start writing down bullet points, things okay. that you have not forgiven yourself. It could be five items on the list. It could be 15, it could be 20, it could be 30, it could be 50, whatever. When you're done, put a number next to it on a scale of one through 10. A 10 is I literally murder somebody. Like I kill a human being. Like that's a 10. Yeah. A one is, you know, I was at the restaurant the other day and I spilled some wine on my white shirt and it was embarrassing. That's a one. And I put them in order, one through 10, and let's begin. And, and that's what I do with my clients. And you start with the ones, twos, and threes. The easy ones, you gain some momentum, you get to your four, fives, and sixes, and then maybe you have seven and eights. So you do it that way. But here's the funny thing. What I discovered, especially because I work with a lot of executives who are men, they do it differently. And the first guy that told me, that goes, oh, that's not how I'm going to do it. I'm like, what? That's my process. He goes, no, I'm going to start with my tens first. And, like, yeah. and the thinking was, if I can do the higher numbers, I can do the rest of it is easy. Yeah. Frankly, Marta, I don't care which way you go. I just want to... Fine. It's all good. Just do it's it. All... No, dude, it doesn't matter which way you go. Yeah. Me, it makes sense to start smaller and then build some momentum and do it. Yeah. If you want to do it the other way, go for it. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Self-forgiveness. And when we're done, you take that piece of paper, you take a lighter and you light it up and you burn it and you let the smoke go up to the heavens and you're leaving. I have done this hundreds of times. When people walk out of this door, out of my office, and we hug and say goodbye, say, Dr. Ely, I feel like a thousand pounds has been lifted off of me. My only regret is I didn't do this sooner. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because lack of forgiveness, again, the greatest act of self-compassion is like carrying a backpack full of rocks every day. Get up in the morning before you brush your teeth. Let me put my shame, my guilt, my all the stuff I haven't forgiven myself. And, that, and, and people walk through life with dead weight. Yeah. For decades, yeah, you, decades. So now's the time. Today's the day. Do it and get it and have some. If you, you can do it on your own, or you or have a trusted advisor, a coach, a therapist, your best friend, and go through this process and do it today. Mark my words. Tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and say something's different. I don't know what it is, but I feel great. Yeah, I love it. My process is slightly different. I don't think I've ever even called it forgiveness, what I think of is painful thoughts or regrets or something I might be ashamed of or wish had happened differently, right? You get into these little finny places in your mind. And sure. I've, when I catch myself doing that, I think of it as like a little plate of poop, a little plate of poop that I'm collecting, right? And I got this little plate of poop. And sometimes the, the plate is bigger. And when I think of it that way, it makes me giggle, right? Because no one wants to carry around a plate of poop. If I handed you a plate of poop, you'd be like, no, thank you. More pain. Yeah. <laughs> We do this to ourselves. Someone hands us a plate of poop and we're like, okay, thanks. And you take it and then you carry it around with you. And you're like, why is it ruining my day? It smells terrible. Put down the plate of poop. So I've started to use that as my own little mental visual reminder. And it's shockingly effective. And I'm curious something else about since you brought this up. The poop oftentimes is other people's projections. Yes. Yeah. It's not even real. It's that, it's, you know, it's there, and it's there, by the way, and they're projecting onto you because they, they, they haven't learned how to own it yet. No. So for me and my boundaries, I'm very clear. It's like, nope, that's not mine. That's yours. If it's mine, I'll own it and I'll work on it and I'll apologize if I need to. That, of course, I'm not a perfect human being. But a lot of the times it's not mine. It's other people's projections. And I like, I throw it right back at them. Like, nope, I don't own that. That's yours. That's your homework. I get my own homework. I'll do it. I'm not going to do your homework. That's you. So turn around, look in the mirror, and own it. Yes, beautiful. I love that. And that's kind of that's a very masculine energy the way that I did it just right now. I mean, I'm I'm very much in touch with my feminine side, like se I would say seventy five percent. But there's a twenty five percent of me who my my paternal grandmother was Spartan, like the three hundred. Like this is Sparta, and she was a tough lady. So yeah. even though I'm all love and happiness and joy, there's twenty five percent of that is very masculine, like Spartan. And I call that Kenyan. I love it. Yeah. Here you mess. You come out very often, but if you mess with me or my family or whatever people that I love, the, the, the Spartan comes out. Yeah. yeah, I believe it. I believe it. And then you forgive yourself later. Yeah, because sometimes the Spartan is a little rough. Yeah. I mean, don't mess with my loved ones. That's it. You yeah. know? Totally. Yeah. I and believe it. Oh my gosh. I'm loving this conversation. Dr. Ilya, what are you working on now? Like, what if my listeners, love this convers conversation as much as I do and they want to learn more about you or work with you or come hear yeah. you speak, what's the best way for them to find out what you're working on and tell us yeah, about In terms that. of connecting, I would love to, yeah, come follow me on LinkedIn and Instagram. I guess those that would be the two. But the biggest thing that I'm working on right now, and it happened two weeks ago, so this is brand new. I, you're probably the, the second, third person that I say this publicly. I just signed a contract to have my own television show called The Happy Hour, or The Happy Hour with Dr. Ilya. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. And yeah. it's going to be on the Mental Health Television Network, MHTN, which is a, a brand new network. The show is already going to be streamed in 55 countries. So it's a, basically, MHTN is what ESPN was for sports 40 years ago. It's for mental health. Oh, I and love it. it, it yeah. And you need, if you haven't checked out MHTN.org, I mean, go and check out this amazing place who really want to be the source and the place for anything that has to do with mental health. And although mental health can be a heavy topic, and this is one of the reasons why they like what I bring is we want you to do a, a show about happiness. Mm -hmm. And of course, this, this to me is a dream come true, honestly. Yeah, I bet. I bet. So is it going to be like an interview style show or what's the format? Yeah. So season one's 26 episodes and the other 26 weeks they're going to, you know, replay basically. And the whole goal is to get as much viewership as possible. So I have an option for season two. I will have 26 guests. 
from influencers to celebrities, to professional athletes, to psychologists, basically anyone that has a story to tell that had some struggles, like we all do with uh, mental health, have overcome them and now are thriving in life. And it's like, okay, tell me your story. How did you do that? You know, some tips. So that's the idea behind it. Oh, and I love it. I love it. And when will we be able to start watching it? I, I think the first week in September. I'm, I'm going to start recording uh, in two weeks and I'll take all of August to, to record uh, half the season. And then we're taking off going to Greece for September, October, and then I'll come back in November and record the second half of the season. But it's actually half an hour, but happy half hour doesn't sound as sexy. So I like the happy. Yeah, it's got a nice ring to it with the hour. I love it. Yeah, and, okay, and it's happy hour. Happy hour, Dr. Ely, it's going to be, and we're going to have fun too. It's going to be emotional, inspiring, authentic, real, just like you and I. This is one of the most real podcasts I've ever done. And I've done over 250 of them. You and I, what we just now today is awesome. Yeah, yeah, awesome. I feel it. I feel it. So if your show is like this, it's going to be good stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I'm really excited about that because I almost retired a couple of years ago. I was like, am I done? You know, life is good. And then I realized, what are you retiring from when you love what you do? Right. Right. Like, you know, stop forgetting what the world says in certain age or whatever. Do you love what you're doing? Yes or no? Yes. Well, keep doing it for as long as you can do it. That's it. And live your best life and live your best life now. Remember, don't procrastinate your happiness. Yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. You've given us so many beautiful nuggets suggestions, easy to remember, digestible pieces of brilliance really around how to forgive yourself, love yourself, live your best life, have compassion for yourself. I'm so grateful for this conversation. And I think before we land the plane, I'd love to ask you just one more thing. I ask every one of my guests, and that is if you had one little tip, pearl of wisdom, like one thing that my listeners can do right now to increase their level of happiness, like they, they, stop to the end of the show, and then they do this one thing. What is that one thing? I think just to be kind to yourself. I think it's easy to be kind to other people. I think we're very capable, especially when they do it automatically, second nature, right? They're so good at being kind and loving and, and serving other people. Sometimes we are so busy taking care of everyone else that we forget, you know, but you, you, that's why it's not selfish self-care. That's why it's actually essential been a great interview. It's been a great, uh, love my time with you, Marta. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuli. It's yes. been such a pleasure. Can't wait to watch your show. Thanks for being on Be Marvelous and have a marvelous day. A happy marvelous day. If you've ever met someone who's genuinely thriving, someone who is radiant, magnetic, and wildly alive and wondered, what's their secret? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the Boo Marvelous Podcast.